you want to learn to create unicorn scale to the moon ads, then this video is for you. I'm going to break down exactly how I go from idea to winning creative again and again. So if you're a media buyer, a business owner, or a creator making ads, then you're in the right place. Step one is research. You're going to do a lot of research in order to actually learn how to make creatives that make your audience tick. I know this part tends to make people's eyes glaze over, but this is actually the most important step. I've also had a number of people ask me how I do competitor research. So I'm going to show you exactly how I do that. Now, the first thing you need to do is actually determine who your competitors are. And in most cases, you're probably already going to be well aware of who your competitors are. But if you're a smaller brand and you don't really know who too many of your competitors are, what I would actually do is go to the competitors that you are aware of, go to their Facebook accounts, go to their Instagram pages and hit follow. There tends to be recommendations when you follow those people or like their pages. And a lot of times I end up finding new competitors that way. And once I find those competitors, I'm going to be looking at their websites. I'm going to be looking at their social media, paying really close attention to what type of content they're producing on their Instagram, to how they're communicating with their users on TikTok and what type of content they're actually making. Another little hack here is I really like to go through the comment section of my competitors to see how they're communicating with their customers and also what some of the frequently asked questions are of some of those brands. I'm also going to search up that industry on TikTok top ads. So I'm going to take a look at the top ads from that specific industry, like for the beauty industry, for instance. So if I'm going to be working with a new beauty brand, I'm going to go out and see, okay, what type of ads are actually trending or getting the best results in theory on TikTok top ads. And I'm going to go through, make a note of who those key players are, but also look at a few factors in their creative. Number one, what types of creators are they using? What types of hooks are they using? How long are their ads? What type of flow do they seem to be using or recipe for their ad creative? And what I like to do is I actually like to screenshot the things that stick out to me and feel sticky as a user and I'll put them in a quick word document or in a pitch deck, something that I can just quickly review myself or even sometimes with the client. Now, the next thing that I'm gonna do for brands, especially if it's my first time working with them, is I'm going to look at their past performance. So if I already have access to their ads account, I'm going to be looking, of course, at what their top performers are. I'm gonna be cross-analyzing those top performers with what I call storytelling KPI. So I'm gonna be looking at hook rates. I'm gonna be determining, okay, what type of hooks have been the most impactful in getting users to stop. I'm also going to be looking at hold rate. Hold rate generally tells me, okay, what type of subsequent messaging and imagery and editing styles retain users the best. I'm also going to be looking at things like average video watch time. Um, and then also taking note of things like age breakdown, placement breakdown, gender breakdown, um, just so I can get a sense, okay, where are we actually spending our money on these platforms and where are we actually showing up and how is that affecting the content that we're creating and how is that affecting where we are actually being placed in terms of age and gender. Now, if you don't have access to a brand's account, so say you're a UGC creator and you've been contracted to make ads for a brand, um, they're probably not going to be giving you ad access. But what I would do is I would look through their ad account and make note of the types of videos that they're creating. Take a look at how they're beginning the first three seconds of their ads. Make note of the type of visual visual imagery that they use in that first three seconds and also make note of the key messaging points that they're making within this time as well. Something else I always look at is when the product is actually introduced. In my experience, I really try to introduce the product within the first five seconds, sometimes sooner, sometimes a little bit later, but there have been many times where I've determined that ad performance was really poor because the product wasn't introduced to second 12 or even second 20. So we're still in the research portion, right? We determined who our competitors were. We looked up those competitors on social media, and we also took note of the website and the subsequent messaging that tends to have a common thread through ad and landing page and website. And then we also took a look at past performance for our brand if we had it. The next and final step of the research portion is actually going out to the ad libraries of our competitors. Now, of course, we could do this when we're originally looking at the organic social media, but I actually like to keep that separate so that I can have a sense of how their competitors are positioning themselves organically versus what they're doing on paid. And when I'm going through these ad libraries, I'm actually saving the ads so that I can refer back to them. Maybe there was a hook I thought was interesting or a messaging point I thought was interesting or an editing style. Now I save all of these ads on Foreplay, which is also the sponsor of today's video. Foreplay is my new favorite tool for 2023. 
you heard it here. Using this tool, you can save your ad inspiration forever. So for those of you who have copied a link you saw in the ads library and sent it to a colleague or to a client, and lo and behold, that link disappears a week or even a few days later, I have been there multiple, multiple times, but that does not happen with foreplay. It actually saves your ad in a board of your choosing forever. You can also download MP4s and they just added the feature where you can actually upload ads to foreplay, which is something that my team has been specifically asking for. <laughs> I create boards for each of the clients that I work with so that I can save some competitor ads. I can save their ads if something is performing really well. So we want to track those top performers and also other ad inspiration that I want to communicate with a client or keep for myself. I've actually stopped using the ad library as much because they also have a discovery feature. And this is where you can see ads that have been saved by other users and also the brands that have the most amount of ads saved. It's essentially the largest curated ad community in the world. There's also a demo AI keyword feature, which is also another good way for you to find competitors. So you can type in things like beauty, like SaaS, and you can find brands that are creating that type of content. I also keep a board for the UGC that I make for other brands. Also, I keep a foreplay board for the videos that show up on this YouTube channel, like right here and right here. My editor took these right from my four playboard. He downloaded them from it. Um, and you guys can now have access to that in the description bar below. I know so many of you are like, Derek, can you please send me the links of the ads? And I was like, no, but now I can, and it's way easier with this platform. Fourplay is gonna give you a free week-long trial, and they're going to give you 15% off by using the code DARA, D-A-R-A, for your first three months. It's honestly the best deal that they have. Real talk, we use Foreplay at Thesis. Yes, the name is kind of funny, but it is genuinely a tool that I cannot live without. Like, hands down. Now, you know, we are at this point in the video and all that I've talked about so far is the research portion. We still have three other steps to go. The second step is, you know, after you've done all that research, it's time for you to create the brief, the storyboard or the script for your content. And for UGC, of course, it's all about the script and brief. And what has helped me out a ton is I have a go-to recipe for writing my UGC scripts. Seriously, I always operate within these parameters. I made an entire YouTube video about it, but this format has enabled me to not get lost in the sauce of like just showing up to an empty format and has enabled me to create winning ads for the clients that I do make UGC for again and again and again. So very quickly, because I have an entire video about this, the recipe goes like this. Have an engaging hook. The best ones are gonna relate to your product, but they're gonna be super eye-catching and they're also going to have some sort of really sticky messaging point. Next, you're gonna agitate the problem. So you're going to give like some personal history about how this problem has affected you. Oftentimes in the hook, I like to focus on the problem. After I agitate the problem, that's when I introduce the product. And then I go through a series of benefits, give some testimonial, and then I end with a catchy CTA. This is literally the format that I use to script all of my UGC content. And honestly, I make dope ads. Like I don't only just talk about ads on this channel. I also work as a UGC creator for some of the top brands, you know, with thesis, not with thesis. And like, my stuff performs well. <laughs> also to note that Foreplay now has a briefs section that is currently in beta. I am really excited to test this out over the next few weeks because I'm already linking out to Foreplay boards or linking out to ads using Foreplay. And I'm really excited to like try out this brief format and see if it can increase my workflow or like better my workflow in some way. So TBD on that. Step number three is pretty self-explanatory, but once you've done all the research, once you've made the script and you've used my award-winning UGC script format, then it's time to actually produce and to edit the work. Now, if you are making creatives with already existing content, then it's really about finding as many different clips and angles as you can to overlay that storyline. And if you're creating like an image creative, for instance, I've often found that it's really useful for me to do a really quick mock in Figma or even Canva so that when I'm trying to explain to a designer or to an editor what I actually want to show up, they have a really quick reference 
point. Of course, I'm going to be linking out to like an example on foreplay, but sometimes, you know, that's obviously not going to be a direct translation. So I like doing like quick mock-ups as well, especially for image creatives. Now, if you are doing UGC creatives, I do have a few tips to get your UGC creators to shine. First one is jump on a call with a creator. Now, I know this seems a little superfluous, but when we're working with a creator for the first time at Thesis, we actually like to jump on a call with them to go over the brief in depth and also encourage them to brainstorm and come up with ideas for their own. Yeah, we do tend to write out the scripts for them pretty detailed um, and, and we do give them options of what they want to say, of course, but creators make the best content when they're putting their own little sparkle to it. And just so you know, like I'm now going through the process as a creator myself with working with additional agencies and going through their workflows. And for every single agency that has started contracting me as a creator, especially on the YouTube side, all of them have jumped on a call with me or a Zoom with me and allowed me to ask questions about the brand that they wanted me to make content for and gotten to know me on a really personal, and gotten to know me on a really personal level. When you're working with creators, the relationship building part of it is honestly most of it. And also treating them right, paying them fairly, like. At Thesis, we pay creators probably more than average. Another thing I like to suggest to getting your creators to make the best content is let them live with your product a little bit. So I've really started pushing my growth teams and my creative teams to give creators like two weeks to live with the product and then make the content. That tends to help me out a lot too. Like if I'm making content for another brand, like if I get to like hang out with the product and use it for myself and see how I would actually integrate it into my life, that actually tends to bring out the most authentic testimonial. Also, and finally, get as much B-roll as possible. If you have to contract your creators to supply additional um, B-roll or RAWs and you have to pay them more, it's always a thousand percent worth it to just get as many different clips as possible. Step number four, you're gonna have to QA your ad creative with a super critical eye. And these are the questions that I recommend that you ask yourself when reviewing all creatives. Number one, can you tell what the product is at second one? Can you tell what the product is at second three or five? When is the product actually being introduced? In my experience, I've found that the later that you wait to actually introduce the product or introduce, you know, what the hell we're talking about, that tends to be a huge variable when it comes to performance. Oftentimes I'll look at ad creatives and brands or clients will ask me, why doesn't this ad work? It's beautiful. It hits on all the core tenets of your UGC recipe. What's going on here? And I'm like, yeah, it's at second 15 where the product is actually introduced. There are obviously some times where you don't have to introduce the product right away but that just tends to mean that you've produced a really engaging piece of content and that's kind of harder to replicate. Personal storytelling can be a huge driver in performance and that's where when creators are sharing really unique personal histories, that's where I tend to find that this product introduction doesn't really matter as much. But again, that's kind of harder to get to. So I like to focus on trying to bring the product or the aha moment up as far up as possible in the actual ad unit. Next thing, can the product be possibly mistaken for something else when it is introduced? And the reason why I like looking at this is I've worked with several CPG brands where when I was introduced to the product on their ad, I actually thought it was something else. I feel like this is really common in the skincare industry. So I always encourage people to take a step back and it's like, do you really understand the product that you're showing? Um, and I think this is really hard for people that just work for a single brand because they're so immersed in it and a lot of things are just like, oh yeah, that's obvious. It's often not obvious um, is like the key takeaway. So really try and look at each piece of creative that you make as someone who has no idea who or what you are. The next question you need to ask yourself is, does this creative seem native to the platform? This is not only going to be for TikTok, I feel like it's a really obvious one, but also think about where your ads are being mostly placed on Facebook mobile or Facebook desktop or Instagram stories versus reels. You also need to have a critical eye for what's actually native versus what is brand driven native. This is something that I see often a lot is like brands will use UGC and then they will take their own text and like have their own font on it thinking that, oh, this is going to increase brand affinity. Blah, blah, blah. No, this is signaling to people that it's an ad and it doesn't look native and people should just like move away because you're just trying to sell them something. So if you actually want to test out UGC and you actually want to try reaching a different demographic, try actually making native ads, actually use Instagram stories text, actually use TikTok text. 
I've never ever seen an ad increase in performance by using brand owned fonts. Another th question to ask yourself is to what extent are you using brand owned terms? And are these absolutely clear to your viewers? There have been a number of times where I've looked at ads on TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram, and they were using some brand owned term for their product. I often see this again in skincare, beauty, or even fashion, and I'm like, what does that even mean? Like, I don't know exactly what that product is. And there's a lot of confusion around um, the what <laughs> is the actual product. So like, again, it's all about taking a step back from your ad unit and being like, is, am I being clear here? Or is there room for um, misinterpretation? Another thing I encourage you to do is take a step back from your creative visually. What is sticking out the most? This is really hard to read a huge jumble of text. What is jumping out visually? What messaging points are actually sticking with you? Because the reality is no one's going to sit there and watch your entire ad, read all this stuff. They're going to be doing different things. They're going to be watching TV. You're going to catch them on the toilet. You're going to catch them in a bath. You're going to catch them on their morning commute. Like they are doing a million other things instead of looking at your ad. What sticks out the most? Also, is your creative making the user work? I've often her brands say like oh yeah like confusion is good because people are curious it's like no you confuse people and they don't want to work um so they scroll on like you are not scooby-doo <laughs> oh god <laughs> okay so at this point if you've answered all of those questions positively you should have an ad that's going to perform a lot more i was recently asked um, what type of people make the best creative strategists um, for brands. And I think one of the things that I think about a lot, especially when I make UGC content, because whenever time I make UGC content for a brand, I act as their um, creative strategist essentially. And that's why I only partner with brands I think I'm gonna really like, because I think if you can find a creator that um, embodies your uh, core consumer, um, that's gonna be like a hack. So like find people who are already making content about your niche, find people who are already passionate about your industry and like it, enlist them to make that content for you. Those are the only brands that I work with to make UGC content because honestly, like I don't like faking it. Um, and like that, that's how it should be and it feels more authentic and I can more authentically speak to that and that's it. Huge thanks again to Foreplay for sponsoring this video. Be sure to sign up with my link below for 15% off for your first three weeks and you also get the first week free. I'm gonna say it, you're gonna try it out for a week, you're gonna love it, you're gonna sign up. It's just that good. Ask literally anyone on Twitter. I'll see you guys next week, bye.